If you're a dad, you're not afraid to work hard. Never give up. Never compromise. And the best dads always look for ways to get better. I'm looking for something to energize me. I'm looking for something to push me further. And I'm looking for something to go with these nachos. Dad Fuel. The energy drink designed just for dad. So I can finish the fight. So I can finish the race. So I can finish mowing the lawn. And later on, I might watch some golf. The fuel dads need to do the things dads do. Climb the highest peak. Go the furthest distance. Check the scores. Read the newspaper. Give amazing relationship advice. Why are you crying? You should really talk to your mother about that. Dad Fuel comes loaded with taurine, ginseng, and 100% of your daily recommended value of Hi Hungry, I'm Dad. I start every morning with the four D's. Devo's, donuts, Dad Fuel, down blanket. Breakfast of champions, baby. Now available in four bold flavors. Original orange, grow model raspberry, grow master mango, and I thought I told you to take out the garbage grape. You can't touch my passion. You can't touch my drive. And you definitely can't touch my thermostat. No way. So whether you're thirsty for victory or just plain thirsty. No, seriously, it's empty. Can I get another one? Dad Fuel. Because I am fearless. Because I am unstoppable. Because the players on TV aren't going to yell at themselves. Come on! Throw the ball! <laughs> Stay off the thermostat. I've never heard that in my life. <laughs> Hey, we want to welcome you guys to Christ Church on the Move. Would you, would you stand with us? And I just want us to, to paint a picture in our heads this morning as, as we listen, as we sing, as we interact with each other. We, we, get a, we get a cool behind privilege, if you think about it, an invitation from the creator of all of the universe who holds everything in his hands. And he's like, hey, I want you to come over here and be with me. I hope this morning that all of us will just take a moment and tap into that beauty, that, that amazing reality that God wants to be here with us. He's, he's got every right to just throw one lightning bolt or a flood or anything else and obliterate us, but he doesn't. And he's like, nope, instead of killing you all, I'd rather spend the day with you. And I'm like, thank you, Jesus. I hope you'll worship with us this morning. <laughs>
you guys just take a, a quick second and tell people around you good morning and if you see your father tell them happy father's day if you haven't said so to your dad you might want to say so at some some level and then tell people we're glad to see you this morning forgot to do that forgot to do what <laughs> tell my dad happy father's day <laughs> whoopsie <laughs> second we'll get we'll continue worshiping in just a second I want to share just a couple uh, brief announcements with you as we continue in this time man we are so excited to have you here at Christ Church on the move um, just want to remind you guys this Thursday is a stay-at-home work camp meal for the Lake Wales Care Center uh, if you would like to come help us uh, we're gonna be setting up tables here in the foyer around 5 o'clock at 6 30 we're serving the meal uh, so we need hands just kind of come and just serve that meal we've got all the food prepped and ready to go uh, but we'd love to have you here on Thursday night. Uh, Friday night, we're doing family game night. So if you would like to come make a connection around the game table, if you'd like to get some of that competitive energy out, we would love to have you join us. We're going to have a game set up of a different variety. So you can bring the kids as long as they're happy to play whatever games are, are set up. Bring some family favorites and come join us with that. We're going to have pizzas and uh, bring some snacks to share, and that'll be a good time. The last uh, Saturday night, uh, there is a women's committee meeting. Uh, so ladies, if you wanted to be a part of that women's committee uh, program, just come see Dee Dee Tripp here on the front row here, and she'd be happy to get you the rest of the information you need. Guys, we are so excited uh, that, that you're here with us. And we offer uh, our hearts and praise and worship. Each week, we offer an offering to God. And so if you came prepared to give a gift, there are ba uh, boxes hanging on the wall. There are trays on the back tables. Feel free to give as you come prepared to give. But let's celebrate and worship today. Let's remember that God is good. He is faithful. There is no one like him. He's indescribable. Let's stand and let's sing again. From the highest of highs to the depths of the Creature unique in the sun that is seen. 
thank you, God, is the, is the response that we have not only confronted by your holiness, by your, by your power. Thank you for sparing us. Thank you for, for enduring us. But God, thank you for loving us. Thank you for saving, redeeming, and inviting us into your, into your family, into your presence. We thank you. We worship you, Jesus, because you are good. And we ask this in your name. And God's people said, Good morning. Happy Father's Day. And yes, I was one of those kids that were in the house with the thermostat. My dad used to threaten us. Do not touch the thermostat. I think that's why I always have it very low now. I love it. Anyway, I am blessed to be daughter number two out of five with my dad. And his name was Bill Gossett. And I grew up my whole life with people saying, oh, you're Bill Gossett's daughter. Oh, I know your dad. Oh, it's so, you must be so happy that he's your dad. Yeah, I was. I was very blessed. And sometimes I can see my children going, <laughs> we see the same thing. But it was a blessing, but sometimes it was even a curse because especially when I was trying to do something I wasn't supposed to do, I would always see somebody I knew. And I can remember in college, I was getting ready to go out after curfew and all I could think about was seeing in the Indianapolis Star, Bill Goss's daughter caught after curfew in Castleton. You know, I, I just, I worried about it all the time because I wanted him to be proud of me. It, you know, it always made me think twice. You know, daddy had five daughters. We, had, we called them four regulars and one Filipino. He was electrical contractor. He was the head of the board of trustees in the church. He was an officer in a lot of clubs. He was in the Lions Club. He was in the PTA. He was a Shriner. He was in the Scottish Rite. And he was also a 33rd degree Mason. I was very proud of that. But I, I think something that, what that was the most was that he went above and beyond helping other people. My dad had a huge serving heart. And he served the church and he served the community well. But one of my most vivid memories when I was older, growing up with all this, was the Sunday I saw him get up out of his pew and walk down front and talk to Pastor Ricketts about accepting the Lord into his life. And I was so confused because I thought, I'd grown up in the church. I've only known my dad to be in the church. I was in shock. That was a moment I'll never forget because he said, we can give the world all we've got, but if we don't give them Jesus, it doesn't mean a thing. And Jesus gave it all, sacrificing it for us. How cool was that? A life that we live. You know, communion is our reminder of this sacrifice. It brings us back to remembering the reason why we're actually here to serve. It is a memory. You know, my daughter said to me this week, set it in your clock on your phone to pick up Maverick at 4.30. And I said, okay, because I'll forget. That's what communion is. It's like a, a weekly reminder that we have that Christ sacrificed for us. And it's his reminder to us don't forget. Don't forget. This morning, I want you to take a few minutes and just spend some time talking to him. Our ushers are going to come and serve us now. But remember, he was the one that served us so well by giving it all up for us. Father God, we just thank you for this time. We thank you, Lord, that we can have a reminder that you did sacrifice for us. And Lord, we can serve everybody. But if we can't let somebody see you in us, it's not worth a thing. Thank you, Lord. Be with us now in this special moment in time that we get to talk to you in your name. <laughs>
Uh, I read a story the other day about uh, Lawrence of Arabia. After the, the First World War, he brought some of his, uh, his companions to Paris. They'd never been outside of the desert, and they went to Paris on a trip uh, to see the City of Lights. And, and he was amused to find that his companions, who had never been out of the desert, they were so fascinated by the faucets in their staterooms. Like, they would just turn them on and off and on and off and on and off. And he took them out, and as they were getting ready to pack up and go back to home, he was so amused to find them in their bathrooms trying to yank these faucets off the wall. And they explained to him, well, it's, it's very dry in Arabia, and what we need are faucets. And you think about that. They were in Paris, the city of love, the city of lights, and yet where are they? They're in the bathroom trying to yank faucets off the walls. Because Paris is great, I imagine. It's beautiful, but when we go back home, what we really need are faucets. What we really need is running water. What we really need is, is this living water. What, what do you need today? What, what are you desperate for today? What are you searching for? What are you longing for? What do you need? As you gather here in the space, what are you looking for? Like perhaps it's a message that, that stirs your heart and like reaches deep into your soul uh, to the depths of where you find yourself. Maybe today, right now, it's, it's a reminder. What you need is a reminder that you're not alone. 
That even when life is, is pounding hard and things are tough, that, that even in difficult times that you have a reason for hope. And you have a reason to hold on, that there's more to, uh, around the bend. Maybe you need a place to hide. Maybe you need a shelter from the storm. You need a rock and a refuge. And that's what you've come here looking for, to gather around the people of God. Or perhaps you just need to sit and look up at the skies and remember that God is still on his throne. It's painted across the sky that he is still God. And that's, you know, that's what I love about the Psalms. We've been looking at Psalms all year. They speak to the depths of our hearts and, and they flow and they weave themselves through our emotions as a people. Like, like, like our favorite playlist that plays over the airwaves. Psalms is a book filled with ups and downs. It's filled with sadness and joy. There's doubt right next to faith. And in the, in the Psalms, it gives us permission to come to God with all kinds of different emotions. Like you don't always have to be happy when you come to God. And you don't always have to be filled with faith when you come to God. You can just come as you are. And this is how I am today. This is how I feel. This is what I need. God, this is what I need from you today. Like this is where I am and I'm just going to be real with you. Maybe that's what we can do today. We can be honest that the words of Psalm 19 verse 14 can ring true in our lives. Where David writes, may the words of my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. My rock and my redeemer. In other words, what David's saying is, God, I just need to know that we're good. Like, like that, this, this, this relationship is, is going in the right direction. That we're on track. God, I just need to know that we're okay. I just need to know that, that the things that I say and the things that I think about, the, the person that I am, that it's somehow falling in line with who you've called me to be. God, I just need to know that we're on the right track here. Now, to get to verse 14, we've got to walk through the Psalm of David. Because there's a lot that's being said before David utters these final words of the Psalm. And so, so if, you, if you will indulge me, Psalm 19 is where we're going to be today. If you have a Bible, flip over there. And, and, and I want to I look at this together because in Psalm 19, what we're going to see is, is David's going to lead us from a simple knowledge of God toward a deeper relationship, an intimate relationship with God. And he's going he's gonna to go through the ebbs and flows. And, and, and he's gonna, along the way, he's going to answer a question here. One of the most profound questions of our heart. He's going to say, how can we know? How can we know? How can we have confidence that God speaks to us? How can we have confidence that God cares about us? Or that God is even there? He's going to weave this through and he's going to do it in 14 verses. So verse 1, if you have a Bible, let's go. He says, The heavens declare the glory of God. The skies proclaim the work of his hands. And day after day they pour forth speech. Night after night they reveal knowledge. They have no speech. They use no words. No sound is heard from them. Yet their voice goes out into all the earth. And there were words to the ends of the world. In the heavens, God has pitched a tent for the sun. It's like the bridegroom coming out of his chamber, like a champion rejoicing to run his course. And it rises at one end of the heavens and it makes a circuit to the other. Nothing is deprived of its warmth. And so David says, in the skies, God reveals his glory. God reveals his glory to us. And David says the heavens are talking. They're declaring. They're giving a record of something that we need to see. And David, he's a shepherd, right? He's, he's probably spent many countless nights just hanging out under the stars, camping out in, in the wilderness. And maybe he writes this psalm as, as, as morning dawn is just breaking. Maybe the sun's bursting on the horizon. Maybe he's out in the fields near Bethlehem. And he just looks up at the sky and just sees the wonder of God painted across the sky. And he's like, I've just got to capture this and write it down. The heavens, they're preaching a sermon. He said, God's glory is on display and it's undeniable. It's bursting across the sky. And you'll notice he says, the heavens declare the glory of God. Not that they declare his grace, or his love, or his mercy, or his judgment. That's not the story being told. But they declare his glory. The heavens declare the glory of God. And when we look to the heavens, we catch a glimpse of his might. We catch a glimpse of his power, his majesty. And what's interesting is the more we study the universe, the more we dial into all the intricacies that hold everything together, the more we understand, the more it points to the amazing power of our God. The more it explains what's holding it together, the glorious design of the universe, the design that we see, it speaks to a designer. It points to a designer, a glorious designer behind it all. 
And so, in many ways, Psalm 19 is the beginning of a, of a teleological argument. A teleological argument, that's a big word that simply means in apologetics that, that if, if, if things look like there's a, a design, it's pointing to a designer, right? It's the existence of God from the evidence of order and hence design in nature. In other words, when you see something that looks like it was built and put together with intelligence, you can probably assume that some intelligent being did that, right? So if I were to say to you, man, your car is awesome. Like, you've got a really nice ride. It's amazing how it must have spontaneously oozed from the asphalt and just sat there in your driveway. <laughs> like you would say to me, well, there's an idiot, right? You idiot, right? But if I said to you, if I said to you, man, the manufacturer, he really put a lot of thought and detailed the designer of that vehicle, man, they really got it right. You'd be like, well, now you're talking. Now you're on to something. Now that makes a lot more sense. A design speaks of a designer. And guys, when you look at the art that's hanging in the skies tonight, it points to the, how, how much more amazing is the artist behind that picture? The heavens declare the glory of God. And, and get this, their sermon, it's constant, it's continual, it's always going. David says, day after day, verse 2, they pour forth speech. Night after night, they reveal knowledge. And so here we are, we're actually able to observe. We're actually able to look up at the skies and observe planetary movements and rotations and patterns and all these different things. Smart men and women doing this every single day, every day, every night, every week, every month, every year. They're looking and piecing all these uh, astrophysic things together. And we're able to observe this. And so, with what we know, if I were to, able to, if I were to come to you and say, okay, all right, all that we see around us, it's, it's just, just one big fantastic accident. It's a spontaneous generation that just so happened. Like, look at everything. Wow, what a coincidence that all these pieces fit together so intricately that this happened. It's a coincidence. It's a fortuitous occurrence of accidental circumstance. I could say that to you. I could say, and it just so happens that the surface of the sun is a temperature of 12,000 degrees Fahrenheit. And that we just have so happen to be the precise distance from that flaming 12,000 degree Fahrenheit sun to survive 93 million miles, if we were any further or any less, we would either freeze or burn up. If we were in Mars orbit or Venus, we would not exist sitting in this room today. But it just so happens, through some random chance and cosmic uh, for fortune, that we sit at the precise place that we need to be to exist and sit in this room together. And get this, it just so happens that this little sphere called the earth that we sit on, that we call home, it rotates, it spins on its axis 365 times as it makes its way around the sun every year. And you think about that, why not 30 times? Why not 300 times? Why not 200 times? Well, if it only spun 30 times on its axis as it made its journey around the sun, there would be, our, our days and nights would be 10 times longer in whatever ver uh, variable they would be. And, and, and it would either be epically cold or extremely hot. Life would not exist if the earth wasn't rotating exactly precisely 24 hours every single day. It would not exist. And, and, but it's, it's, it's a marvelous accident how that just came to be. And I could say to you, it just so happens that the earth is tilted 23 and one third degrees, precisely 23rd and one third degrees, so that we can have four seasons. Somewhere, not, not here, but somewhere they get to have four seasons. So that it, it, the, the season, the, the, the earth begins to breathe and has these moments. And furthermore, it just so happens that the atmosphere that we breathe, it's a perfect balance of ox oxygen and nitrogen. 79% to 20% with 1% of variant gases. It's amazing how that just so happened to be the precise mixture to allow us to breathe in and breathe out. You say, why not 50-50? Well, if it was 50-50, we, we couldn't be able to breathe into our lungs. We would just fall over dead. And the first person to light a match would just blow the whole thing up, okay? It would not exist. But there's more. Like, like the, the water to land ratio of the earth is just so marvelously balanced. There's 71% of the earth's surface that is ocean. 71%. Did you know that if the ocean were half the dimensions that they are presently, we would have one-fourth of the annual rainfall on the planet? Everything on earth would be a drought. A drought that could not produce life. And if the oceans were one-eighth larger than what they are right now, there would be four times the amount of rainfall. And every place on Earth would be a flood zone. What we know as life would not exist if these things were not precisely 
intricately put in place. But you know, I could say to you, it's a marvelous accident. It's, it's cosmic fortune. It all happened by some random chance over billions of years. But which is more plausible? Which takes more faith for you and I to see intricate design and to assume a designer behind it? Or that all that we see came to be on its own? It just so happened to be. And David says, guys, you can't help but know. There's not a one of us in this room that just can't help but know. We may not fully understand. We may not have all the pieces beyond that. But it's pretty obvious that we did not just happen by some random chance. You can't help but know that there is a God, that there is a creator, that there's a sustainer. You may not know what that God is like, but you know he's there. That being exists. Just look around everything in the world. Just look in the mirror. You are a miracle walking right now. And you can't deny it. It's obvious. It's written on every page as you stare at anything in this world. In fact, listen to what the Apostle Paul writes in Romans 1. He says, he says this in verse 18. He says, the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the godlessness and wickedness of people. Why is God angry? Because they suppress the truth by their wickedness. Since what may be known about God is plain to them, because God has made it plain to them. He's not hiding. He's not made it difficult for us to see. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power, his divine nature, they have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that people, you and I, that we are out without excuse. It's undeniable. There are some things that go without saying, right? There are some things that we just don't need to talk about. You don't have to make a case for it. It's just obviously that's how it is. And David writes here in Psalm 19, and Paul agrees here in Romans 1 that God is obvious. You do not have to make a case for God to exist. You just have to open your eyes. But in our culture, don't we sometimes still say things that go without saying? Like, we do it all the time. So I'm going to say something that goes without saying. Like, thank you, Captain Obvious. That's awesome. Thank you. If you weren't here, I would not have known that. But now I've got it clear. I mean, we've all seen the signs, haven't we? We have all seen the signs and wondered what idiot needed this sign. And should we be concerned that they're walking among us? Like, who needed this spelled out? For example, caution. Water on road during the rain. <laughs> Guys, that is true of every road when it rains. Every single one. You don't have to question that. Or this one, if door doesn't open, don't go in. Otherwise, it's going to be a really painful process. Just keep hitting your head on the door, right? Like, you would know that, right? Who doesn't know that? Caution, please be aware the balcony is not on the ground level. <laughs> oh, so this is one of those balconies you put up high in the air. I'm confused by that. Or the little, little, you know, furniture down below was, was a clear giveaway. Caution, hot beverages are hot. Do you order a hot beverage expecting it cold? I don't know. Good no. Road unsafe when underwater. In case you thought you had one of those submarine cars that just kind of go through there, right? Or zero feet, no diving. <laughs> Unless you thought the concrete would be a refreshing nap. I don't know. Right there for you. Um, do not breathe underwater. Unless you're the kind that have the gills on the side of your, your neck right there. Like, oh, this is one of those pools you're not allowed to. Can you point me to the one that does? Like, I just, I don't know. Uh, please make sure the elevator is there before stepping on. <laughs> Otherwise, you're going down really fast. This one's my favorite, though. Um, <laughs> guys, I don't know about you, but I, I would know not to. If you're sitting in this room and you see a fence like that, don't sit on it. Like, we would know not to. We get it. Some things go without saying. And when we look at the world around us, the evidence for God, it's obvious. You don't need a sign for it. It's obvious. In fact, one poll suggests that 80% of Americans believe in some concept of God. 80% of our country believe in some concept of God. Now, they may not ascribe to a biblical worldview of God, but they at least can put the pieces together and say, you know what, that makes sense. They can't escape the awareness that something or someone made everything because his fingerprint's everywhere. But guys, listen, believing there's an intelligent designer, believing that there is a concept of God, and knowing this God, those are two very different things. 
Like, we may have 80% of the population that says, yeah, there's something out there in the universe that, that, that is uh, wanting my good or wanting to create what we see. We can marvel at the greatness of, of the universe, but never have a personal relationship with the God of Scripture. You think of it like uh, people that go out to the Hollywood or Los Angeles, and they go on those celebrity bus tours. Maybe you've gone on a celebrity bus tour. Maybe you've heard of people that they just want to go, you know, see the, see the homes of the stars. And so they go on these buses and they travel around and they see so-and-so's house and so-and-so's house. And imagine if that person came back after that trip to California and they say, oh yeah, I know Brad Pitt. Yeah, no you don't. You saw his house from a thousand feet away, okay? <laughs> Seeing and knowing is two very different things. You can know about someone and not actually know them. And for some of you today, that's where you are in your faith. Like, you may believe sitting here that there's a God. And you may even have moments in your life where you have felt God move in your story. But you are very far from a relationship with that God. Maybe you don't realize that. But knowing that God exists and knowing who God is and then knowing him personally, those are very, very different things. And we can cognitively be aware that something made this Scriptures say that this God draws near to us, and he wants to know us intimately. He wants to know us personally. He wants to be known and for us to be known by him. The skies may inspire us to seek God, but what you and I need is for his word to instruct us. And so David continues in verse 7, if you want to just follow along with me. He says, the law of the Lord is perfect, refreshing the soul. The statutes of the Lord are trustworthy, making wise the simple. The precepts of the Lord are right, giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. The fear of the Lord is pure, enduring forever. The decrees of the Lord are firm, and all of them are righteous. They're more precious than gold, than much pure gold. They are sweeter than honey, than honey from the honeycomb. And by them your servant is warned, and keeping them there is great reward. And so David says in the scriptures, God reveals his greatness. God reveals his character. God reveals, uh, he instructs us in the ways of life. And David, is, he's inviting us deeper. He's like, all right, let me get your attention by looking at the skies. Now let me take your, your, your gaze downward into the holy word of God, the scriptures. We move from the looking at the sky to uh, where we feel God to looking at the scriptures so that we might know God. It's not enough to believe there's a higher power or just be inspired by creation. When at some point, we've got to get to know the God who made it all. And the Bible is his written revelation to us. It's his perfect revelation of who he is and who he's called us to be. And guys, right now, most people, they never move to this type of relationship with God. They see and they acknowledge, but they don't go deeper. In fact, I told you 80% of, of Americans say they believe in some concept of God, but that same poll would say only 31% are practicing believers in Jesus Christ. 80% believe God exists. Only 31% actually follow a biblical worldview of who Jesus is and what God has called us to do. See, most people, they want to keep God at a distance. And they want all the dividends of salvation without the disciplines of sacrifice. And they're okay with the God who made the playground, but they don't want to play by his intended rules. They'd rather ignore the signs. Not David. David, he's obsessed with knowing God. In fact, in five verses, he, he, he tries to lay out for his hearers, for his readers, nine ways, nine benefits of, of what pursuing God's word would do in your life. He says, number one, it refreshes my soul. When I come to his word, it fills me up, it renews me, it restores my vitality, it refreshes my soul. Not only that, he says, it challenges my mind. When he came to scripture, it was like, it was like God just continued to challenge him and, and rebuke him and, restore, and, and renew different things and thought patterns. Guys, we say we follow Jesus, but how long and how much have you wrestled with the teachings of Jesus? Because if you just try to gloss over it in Matthew 5 through 7, the Sermon on the Mount, you're missing a lot. Like you can read something that Jesus taught on the surface, but take it deeper. There's 10 new things that he wants to unpack for you. It is so much more depth. There's so much more that's there. It challenges us every time we read the scriptures. David says, not only that, no, it makes my heart happy. 
It makes me glad to come to God's word. It makes me glad to open it up and just pour over the words because in these words I find life and I find hope and it it restores me, it renews me, it directs my life. He says, your word is like a lamp to my feet, a light to my path. It tells me what to do. It guides my steps. It shows me where I should go. It teaches me how to respond. It, It directs my life. Not only that, it gives me confidence in the future. God's word will stand. It is true. It does not fade away. So much in our culture, so much in our life is, is shifting. And, 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 and it's like, like shifting sand. And from one day to the next, we wonder, is this true? No, is this true? What can I say about this? What can I say about this? You can always come to God and know that this is true. This is, this is eternal. And it's a firm foundation for you to put your life on. It is something that gives me confidence for the future. It teaches me the truth. The decrees of the Lord are firm and they are, all of them are righteous. I don't have to wonder where the moral compass is. God's way is true. It's absolute. And when I pursue them, it makes my life better. It's more precious than gold. It's more, more sweeter than honey on the lips. Guys, there's a lot of things that we pursue day in and day out. There are a lot of things that we chase after and say, this, is, this matters more than everything. But David says, no, no, you can take your gold and throw it away. I don't need honey. I've got the word of God. It's what I need. You may think the Paris lights are are pretty. You may think the city of Paris is this city of love. But what we need are the faucets, the living water, the word of God flowing into us and through us. It's what we need. It warns me. It warns me to to, to, to be on guard. when When I'm walking down a path and I know I shouldn't, it pulls me back, it rebukes me, it convicts me, it guides me on the ways of righteousness. And when I have the word of God in my life, it's a reward greater than anything. I find great reward, David says. I find reward when I keep his word. David says it's a treasure to know and experience a deep relationship with God through his word. And guys, what we're talking about here is a very high view of scripture. That this is an absolute, the absolute word of God that does not change. It is perfect in every way. And that when we come to it, we find wisdom. We find uh, a pattern for life that leads us to who God's called us to be. That when we gather around God's word, that, that, that we expect something to happen. When you gather for a time of devotion, when you gather as the family of God, that when you open the word of God, that something's gonna happen. That something's going to move in us. That the Spirit of God is living and active just like His Word is living and active. And it's going to do something in my life. It's going to do something. In my, it's going to challenge me. It's going to renew me. It's going to fill me up. Guys, when you open your Bibles, do you expect that God's going to move? That God's going to call you into something deeper? That God's going to change something in your heart? David writes, look up at the skies and know that there is a God. And then look downward at his word and know who he is. And finally, when we do that, we've got to look inward. Verse 12, it says, But who can discern their own errors? Forgive my hidden faults. Keep your servants also from willful sins. May they not rule over me, then then I'll be blameless and innocent of great transgression. So may these words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Okay, so David, he looks up at the sky and he's like, wow. And he looks downward at the scripture and he's like, that's amazing. And he looks inward at his heart and he's like, yuck, right? Like, because when you see God for who he is in his glory and you know God for who he is, as you say his word, you eventually begin to realize that who I am in light of all that, man, there's problems there. I'm in trouble. I'm not worthy to stand in the presence of a God like this. That's a glorious God, but I, on the other hand, am a very inglorious person. And David says in Psalm 8, when I consider the, the heavens, the work of your fingers, the sun and the moon, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him? See, the revelation of the glory of God means I see myself as I really am. So I realize the glory of God in the skies, and I realize the greatness of God in the scriptures, but what I need is for the grace of God to come to life in my soul. In our soul, God reveals his grace to us. 
See, God's speaking inwardly to us in moments like this. This is the reason we should give God unfettered access to our consciences. What the skies proclaim and what the scriptures pronounce is what the soul should process here and now. It should affect us. Like that story that we know in the Gospels where, where Peter and his companions are out on the Sea of Galilee and they're, they, they've been fishing all night and they're on the shoreline, they're, they're cleaning out their nets and Jesus comes to the shore. He begins teaching the crowds from their boat and a little bit later he says to Peter, put out in the deep waters and we're going to do a catch of fish. Put your nets down for a catch and Peter's like, no, we've been doing that all night and Jesus says, do it anyway. And he does. And they catch such a miraculous catch of fish that there's no, there's no explanation. The, the boat begins to sink. They have to call the other boat over. And Peter, right there and then, he sees Jesus for who he is, the glory of God in his boat. And instantly he realizes, I am not worthy. He falls to his knees. He says, away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He sees something about himself in that moment as he stares at the grace of God in Jesus. And rather than condemnation, Jesus says, no, no, no. You follow me. It should change us when we are face to face with who God is and what he's done for us. Not only that he made the world, but he sent his one and only son to die for those who had yet to believe. That we might know life, that we might have hope, that we might be his. It should change us. It should affect us when that grace comes to life in us. Psalm 19 progresses from a belief in God to a personal relationship with this God. We don't just believe with our eyes. We don't just believe in God with our head. And we've got to believe it here in our heart, in our souls. David invites us to respond. He invites God into his words and into his thoughts. It's almost as if David is thinking, God, God, if you can make the skies look like that, I wonder what you could do with me. I wonder what you would do with my life. And so David says here, he says, when I look around at the world, it's obvious. You are God. And when I look into your word, God, it's obvious that you are God. And when I see what you're doing in my life, even there I know that you are God. And so today, I want to lean my life into all that you are. Today, I want to open my heart to all that you have for me, God, that I might live a life that pleases you. Amen? Let's pray. And so God, may we never lose the wonder of what you've made, what you've created. God, may your people never grow too arrogant, not have eyes to see the beauty, the wonder, the majesty of your power at work. God, it takes far more faith for us to believe that this could be just an accident. And so your children, we are reaching out to you in faith to say, we believe, we long for more of you. God, it's what we need. All these other things we chase after, silver, gold, things that taste sweet to our lips, God, these are not more precious than your word to us. Give us a passion for your teaching. May we apply it to our lives each and every day. God, show us pictures of your grace. Show us pictures of your love that we might be changed and convicted and held firm on the path that leads to life. God, may we know the love and the grace that is found in your Son. In his name we pray. Amen. What are you searching for? What do you need? What are you hoping to find here in this place? And David, he said, I want to please God. I want to live in such a way that the things I say, the things I think about, that they fall in line with who God says I should be. In other words, God, I just need to know that we're good. 
I can recognize that you're before me. I, I just need to know that this relationship is right. And maybe that's where you find yourself this morning. Maybe that's what you're going through, that you're wondering, what do I do? God, what's my next step? I know you're cognitively there, but maybe I don't know who you are and I don't know what you want from my life. God, what do I do with this simple knowledge? Listen, the desire to let God in and change your life, the desire to please God only happens when we experience Jesus. It only happens when we encounter who Jesus is and who he's called us to be. And guys, that happens differently for every single person. Sometimes it's slow, sometimes it's fast, that, that realization. But, but listen, God uses this life to make sure that you know that he is real. And, and then after you've been, uh, he uses his truth to make sure that you recognize that you're lost. And after you've been impressed by who he is, and after you've been instructed by what he says, then you can respond and realize, God, I need you. I need you to fix the broken pieces in my life. Today, if you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, if you've never come to him and put your life in his hands, this is a moment as we sing a song of response. That we might be overwhelmed by the grace of God, his power on display, and respond with a changed heart and come to him. If that's the desire of your heart today, as we sing this song, come talk to me. Or maybe today you just need to pray with somebody about something that's, that you've been wrestling with in your life. We're going to have prayer partners at the corners of the room. Come and pray with us today as we stand, as we sing.
may these words in my mouth and this meditation of my heart be pleasing in your sight. Lord, my rock and my redeemer. May that be our prayer this week as we go out. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a good week.